this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're continuing our discussion about coastal erosion on Oahu's North Shore and the variety of proposed solutions to save the sand, homes, roads, and coastal ecosystem. We start off talking with coastal geologist Dolan Eversoll from the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program. We're here at Sunset Beach, and this is world famous Sunset Beach, best known for its offshore surf, of course. But a lot of people that come here also come just to recreate on the beach. This beach is really vulnerable to seasonal and long-term erosion. Most of the beaches in Hawaii are eroding. 70% of the beaches in the state are eroding in some way. And they can be eroding in a chronic fashion, like a little bit each year, or they can be eroding in a more episodic or event-based erosion. And both are true here at sunset. So we do see a very dynamic nature, and we've all seen it come and go over the seasons. But over the long term, it is showing signs of erosion. One of the things that we've discovered about this area here at Sunset Beach is human foot traffic can cause a lot of erosion. So just huge numbers of people coming to the beach, little by little stepping down on the beach will actually cause erosion. I think that's something people don't really think about. You know, you see a big truck driving on the sand or a large development and that's obvious that it's having an impact, but that the little pieces, individual by individual person, add up over time. That's right, and more frequent question that's emerging now is, well, how many people are coming to the North Shore? And I think I'm not alone in asking that question. Maybe we should better understand how many people are coming to the North Shore, where are they going, how are they accessing the shoreline? Those are all really important management considerations for do we need to build stairways and things like that? Viewing decks are commonly used all over the world. I'm hopeful that we might start to see some of these, I wouldn't call them new technologies, they're very old, but um, new improvements to come into some of the beach parks that are heavily impacted that probably could use areas where people can just come and observe the shoreline without having to actually walk on the sand. And then those that do want to come down to the beach, having a set of stairways, that a series of stairways that allow people access to the shoreline without having to necessarily go down a steep uh, goat trail, for example. You see those all over the North Shore. And in some places that might be okay, but in the heavily impacted areas, for example, Sunset, Pipeline, Waimea, and Haleiwa Ali'i, those are areas where you get huge numbers of people. It's probably time that we start to develop infrastructure that will allow them to access the shoreline without having as much impact. But certainly if we look at the historical nature of this coast, we've essentially developed the coastal dune. Can you talk to me about the importance of these dune systems? The coastal dune system is, includes the beach. The beach and dune are integral to each other and they need to be thought of as a collective ecosystem and how we manage them. And here we're at Sunset Beach, the dune is massive. We're 20 feet above sea level here because the waves have deposited sand for millennia in this location. So that's a natural asset that needs to be protected and preserved. And one of the benefits of having a healthy coastal dune is it serves as a repository or a bank account for sand. Mm -hmm. So that when there is a big erosion event and the waves are starting to chew into an area, it has a reservoir to resupply the beach. So if you have a big healthy dune system, you shouldn't really see a lot of beach erosion. It might come and go, but it has somewhere to extract sand from and resupply the beach, and also somewhere to deposit the sand during those big swell events. And I'm happy to say that the University of Hawaii Sea Grant program is about to release a dune management manual on yeah. how to restore and manage a dune. It's a layperson oriented manual on how to restore a coastal dune, what plant species are appropriate, what plant species are not. And one of our case studies in the manual is right here at Sunset Beach as a successful example of dune restoration. And we've been talking about this dune restoration for maybe four or five years here at Sunset. And I think largely people really support the idea of uh, restoring the dune and limiting access to stairways and fences and things like that. Because we are so heavily impacted with people, 
and visitors in particular, it does justify building certain things, parking lots and stairways and showers, and bathrooms, for example. We've been taking these problems as they come with no real comprehensive plan for how we're gonna deal with it in the coming years. This year, let alone 10 years from now, one of the things I think is missing for how we manage the North Shore is a management plan, mm -hmm. a beach and dune management plan that talks about the short, mid, and long-term strategies, just focusing on the beach itself and how you access the beach, where you park your car, for example. Um, those are all things that could be included in a beach management plan. There is a, a, an effort that just is concluded for a community plan for the North Shore. The community of the North Shore expressed very clearly through this community process, climate change, sea level rise, and beach erosion were like the three big things that the shoreline and protection of the shoreline is one of the most important elements of the character of the North Shore. I can point to a couple examples where community input was critical to the outcome. And one of those is Turtle Bay right here on the North Shore. There was a plan to build five new hotels and it was a huge ambitious de redevelopment plan that the community largely opposed. And as a result, it ended up, the whole plan changed to conservation easements and new beach parks and some new redevelopment, but much, much less than that was originally proposed. In Pupakea, the Pamalu Pupakea development, what was going to be private luxury homes right above pipeline, was nixed because of community opposition to the idea of building up there and now is conserved in perpetuity as state land. So those are two examples I can point to right here on the North Shore where community input and community concern led to a completely different outcome than what was initially proposed. We talk about the value of private property up here and like residents feel that they have the right to protect their pri private property that's worth millions of dollars. That's understandable, but I would also argue that the beach is worth way more than the private property. If we were to do an economic study of the beach, even here at Sunset Beach, if we were to figure out what is the economic value of having this beach here from a social, cultural, and economic standpoint, it's in the tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars per year. We've done that, in fact, in Waikiki, and the beach in Waikiki has been valued at about $2 billion a year. That's a billion with a B. <laughs> so those are the kind of quantitative measures I think we need to help inform the decision-making process for the North Shore. The other is, how many people are coming to the North Shore? We don't know, but we need to have a better understanding of how many visitors, in fact, come here. I think we'll be surprised to learn the North Shore is a major destination but we don't really know those numbers. And once we do, I think we'll have a, maybe a better justification for investment into the resources, into the roads and things like that. Did that answer your question? Okay. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. You're watching Voice of the Sea. We're talking about restoration of sand dunes using native vegetation and strategic fencing. Tim Tubaszewski from the North Shore Community Land Trust explains. This is Pomalu, or Sunset Beach uh, Park. It's a city and county park. We've been fortunate enough to partner with the city and county of Honolulu to do some restoration work here over the past three years. Really, it was a community project. Uh, you know, we had community members from all over the North Shore area that got involved with their input and with their labor and sweat. And what was the impetus, or why did you begin the restoration work? Two, I guess four years ago now, we had a big wave event, a storm event, they caused a big portion of the bike path here to fall, kind of fall into the beach and became quite a hazard. And so the city and county came in and cleaned that up and redirected the bike path to where it was more of a safe location. 
With that happening, we reached out to city and county along with Sea Grant and along with a bunch of community members and tried to see if we could make a, a restoration project happen here that included native plants, coastal plants, that would kind of help slow down the erosion rate and hopefully build back the sand dune over time. Describe the actual process to me of planting the plants and helping to build back the dune. Sure, yeah, so we coordinated with City and County right after they did a sand push, which they tend to do every summer or into summer, early fall. We set up a kind of a strategic plant management plan and, and planting plan that we vetted with the community through some talk story sessions, along with vetting with City and County of Honolulu Parks Department. And then we worked with some native plant nurseries and we're able to get about 4,000 native plants. And then once that was all approved, we basically just kind of rallied the community, had a work day on a weekend, and had about 100 people show up and put in 4,000 plants and help us build this fence, which is just digging holes in the sand and, and putting in the fence posts. So can you talk to me of some of the effects that you've seen of this replanting? Has it been successful? Are you happy with how it's going? Yeah, I'm really, really happy with the way it's uh, come out. You know, it was a really big question mark. I lost a lot of sleep. <laughs> the week coming up, leading up to the planting, you know, there's some people that are like, oh, the waves are just going to take all those plants away. You're wasting your time and money. But, you know, we really thought it through and did the best we could. And we have some experience. I do restoration work at a few other spots, uh, coastal sand dunes out at Cuckoo Point on Turtle Bay's property. So I felt like I had a good grasp of what, what would happen. And yeah, we put it out there and it's, it's been a great success. The plants have really taken hold. They've handled some really big nasty storms and wave events over the past few years. And although sometimes they look pretty sad, they bounce back because uh, that's what they do as coastal natives. But you can see right here in this sidewalk that we've got here, there's a, there's a drop off from the bike path right where the, the beach access is, but where the vegetation is, there's no drop off. And that's all because just foot traffic. And that's only maybe a month or two worth of foot traffic because they just push sand, you know, in October or November. So it hasn't been that long since they push sand here. And that's going to get worse throughout the year as more and more foot traffic happens. I think it's a major problem throughout Hawaii and I think something that we need to start figuring out as a community how we tackle it. If we don't manage it here and save the bike path, the next thing you know we're going to be dealing with the road falling in, you know. So I think it's just try smart to think those things through before it's too late. Do you have plans or ideas or dreams and hopes for this, the sections that, that are still being eroded? Yeah, I really do. I mean, we have plans uh, that we currently have submitted to city and county to put some stairways in this area uh, that are engineer design pr approved so that we can basically get the feet off the sand right at that critical point where the sand meets the bike path so that the sand doesn't roll down that hill quite as much as people come in and out, out of the beach. I'd also love to see like a foot washing station for people to wash off the sand off their feet sure. as they come in. Because if you think about it, everybody that goes to the beach, they've got sand on their feet and then they go back to their car. That sand has now been removed from the beach. You know, it's not a lot, you know, it's just a little bit on your feet. Maybe if your feet are wet, it's a little more because it's more sticking to you. But think of how many thousands and thousands of people come in and out of the beach every day and take that sand with them. And now it's gone. So having a foot wash station, stuff like that, and, and which is kind of like a graded area so the sand can just fall right back through and go back onto the beach. Having that, maybe a, a viewing platform for people who don't necessarily want to go on the beach, but still want to take a picture, you know, a tour bus operator comes by, they come in, the people want to come in, take a nice picture of the area and then leave. They stay out of the way, they're not on the beach eroding the uh, sand, they're not on the bike path in everybody's way. I'd love to see this bike path become a wood, raised wooden boardwalk as opposed to this asphalt. So now the sand can move in and out underneath it and it nat the natural flow is there and then hopefully less erosion will happen along with because of that. More vegetation can grow underneath, underneath it and around it, right? And I think this bike path is amazing. The community loves it. You know, my kids ride it every day to school, but I do think there's still ways to improve it in certain areas to make it better. Are there other locations, other beach parks along the North Shore where we might be able to replicate this? I think so. I mean, you look at Aukai Beach Park, uh, Laniakea Beach, Haleiwa Beach Park. There are so many beach parks that are heavily used by both community and visitors. All of them could really utilize uh, more management of foot traffic for sure. We have come back every summer to do some additional planting and more natives. So every summer we come back and assess what's happened, the beach uh, profile and the vegetation that's still remaining and see how we can help fill in the gaps. And we just water when we plant them the first time and then it's kind of left on their own devices, yeah. Can you give me an estimate of the, so you, the total number of plants? So you, I know you started four years ago, 4,000 initial plants, and then you've been replanting. So how many plants over time? And then maybe uh, an economic cost of, of those plants from the nursery. Sure, so we're probably somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 plants at this point since our first starting. 
And you could probably put a rough estimate of $3 a plant on that as a pretty rough gauge. Some might have been a little cheaper, some might be a little more expensive. And so if you can see behind me here, you kind of see this fence. Uh, this fence didn't exist before. This fence is actually made out of uh, repurposed ironwood that we have from another restoration site. These are all ironwood pieces from two places are Pupakea Pamalu Preserve, the State Park Preserve. That's basically this coastal bluff we see behind us here. We help the state parks manage that area. And also our Kahuku Point restoration site where we have a coastal restoration site over there. Well, this whole area would just be a free-for-all without all this. And uh, all this would be kind of eroding pretty quickly with foot traffic. But here's some of an example of like some of the things we planted. You've got the Aki Aki grass, which is like this native grass here. You've got this Nenea, which is beach pea. This is Ojai right here. This is actually an endangered species. It's on the endangered species list. Really pretty coastal plant. You got some Aveo Veo growing inside of it right there, which is another coastal plant. And then obviously the Nalpaca that's all around it. We try to plant the Nalpaca for more foot traffic related control, and then we plant a lot of the other stuff just to make sure there's a diversity along the dune system. You know, all Nalpaca is not ideal. It can do some things really well, but other plants can do some things better. So we just try to make sure there's a diversity in here. But a lot of the ones that are the smaller ground cover, if there's a large wave event, they tend to get ripped up and they don't make it. So those are the ones we outplant more seasonally. We've been fortunate enough to have some funding from World Surf League to help start us off. But yeah, we can always yeah, obviously use more funding to continue the, the restoration process. But nothing is gonna get done uh, without people in the community caring and acting. Some people think it takes a huge, huge amount of people to make that happen, but really it doesn't. You know, it can just take a handful of people who really care and are active to make things happen. And a lot of people will kind of jump in and once they see things happening, people will be like, oh, that's awesome. I didn't even know that was going on. I want to help too, right? Just getting that ball rolling is really important. And once that momentum happens, you'll really see the community come in and get involved. Looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. watching Voice of the Sea. We're talking with North Shore residents engaged in the fight to protect this beloved stretch of coastline. We meet up with Kathleen Pahinui, chair of the North Shore Neighborhood Board. But first, I catch up with Buddy Shepard, who has lived in the Sunset Beach area for over 70 years. Sunset Beach has changed, and in a lot of ways. Back in the 50s, when we jumped in the water and went swimming, as we were sw swimming, and if the sun was shining and it cast a shadow on the reef, the octopus would shoot ink at us and, and take off. And five feet into the water, you'd, you could always look under a rock and see a baby lobster. That's not happening, it's gone. You go out to the outer reefs and dives and there's still no lobsters. Environmentally, you know, that we have problems with erosion and all that kind of stuff that's going on today. And what I'd like to add to it is that whoever were in charge in the, in the fifth, 1950s permitted um, a company to mine sand on the North Shore. As a kid, I just remember seeing big double trailer trucks every half an hour or every 20 minutes leaving um, backyards. And the trucks would just one behind the other and it'd take about 15, 20 minutes to load. And he was, it was off and running. It was a big arch that the trucks drove through and on the top of the arch had a, um, a chute that loaded the sand that was pushed with a big D9, a big mountain of sand, and they pushed sand daily and hauled it out daily. And, and this went on for years. People say, oh, all this erosion and the oh, tide is high and everything, but they missed the point that when the sand migrates up and down the beach, 
there's no, no sand to migrate. You mentioned concerns about what happens if we do nothing and the ocean keeps coming and it starts taking the homes and the dirt, the chemicals, you know, the cesspools that are, are back from the beach now. No action, I feel, is, and no general plan is, it's gonna make the situation even worse. We're gonna lose our reefs. The, the soil and the ocean, it's just, it's gonna be a mess. It, it's already pretty bad. I really feel that they should shut the beaches down for the marine life because it's, it, it, they're gone. The fish are gone. It, it, we're killing the ocean. Everybody should step up right. and come up with a general plan. You know, you go to Shark's Cove and it's a marine sanctuary. Well, it, all of this should be like that, you know? It was like that at one time. Uh, so, that's my belief. Now, nice seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited to talk to you because you are a North Shore resident and you're participating in these community discussions as a resident not as a political person, not as a scientist, not as somebody from the university. And can you just tell me what these meetings are, are like and kind of about the process from a community member perspective? Sure, um, well, you know, there's a bunch of us on, on, on the groups, the, and there's two groups. There's the Surf Rider group that I was invited to participate in, and then there's the North Shore Sustainable Community. And they're all just regular people, you know, no politicians, just average people who've lived out here, who enjoy the surf, enjoy the community, and just providing their perspective from years of living out here. Tell me where we're at and a little bit about this place. Okay, uh, this is Haleiwa Beach Park. This is a very well used old beach park. And one of the concerns we have that, you know, we were dealing with is there was a seawall that fell down not too long ago and it's been I, more or less repaired. The seawall got put in because you can see that jetty out there that just put in in World War II and it started eroding the beach and it so severely that they had to put a seawall in. Well, the seawall finally fell down and needed to be fixed because it was, it was very dangerous. But that goes to the question, if we didn't have the jetty, would we need the seawall? Mm -hmm. Not an engineer, but common sense would say, if you don't have something there preventing the sun, sand from building up, you wouldn't need these structures put up. Maybe we take the jetty out. Maybe that, you know, if that's been the problem, let's get rid of the jetty and then we won't need the seawall. You know, so I think there are ways to improve it. Uh, but overall, I love what we have here and I wouldn't want to change it for anything because this is, this place is very special to a lot of folks who've grown up here. But that maybe we could improve upon so we don't have to have a seawall where it's safe and the beach comes back and, and then we have this beautiful beach as you can see all the way down and have a lovely beach that meets up over there with Puena. So that would be really, really nice. People who are having similar issues in their neighborhood what is your advice for them? Where can they go to make a difference? Going to your uh, community neighborhood board is always a great place to start. We have wonderful boards on this island. So there's a lot of good community associations and neighborhood. I would start with those areas. There are many ways to help, from beach restoration to neighborhood planning. Your input is needed to save the beaches and coastal zones in Hawaii and across the world. Get involved to save the beaches you love today. Learn more at voiceofthesea.org and follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.